Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is James. I'm from our education department. We have Dana helping control the computer, and Dave is over helping answer some of your questions. You can text in questions to us while we're live here at a very special number, 562-283-1838, or 286. Oh, so close. 562-286-1838. And we can answer your questions live. We can also answer them on the air for you. So if you want to say, hey, I'm so-and-so from Rever, or you don't have to tell us who you are, you can just ask us your amazing questions and we will help answer them for you. Today, we're going to be talking about coral reefs and their conservation. Coral reefs are an amazing place to be. They are a beautiful habitat. They are a very special habitat only found in certain regions of the world. And we're going to talk about what coral is and some of the animals that live around the coral, and then some of the things that people are doing to try and help maintain the health of those coral reefs. Now we're gonna be looking at some artifacts, we're gonna be looking at some of our webcams, and we're gonna be looking at a lot of images of some of the animals that live around the coral reef. Well, that webcam we actually started the stream with is our largest habitat here in the entire Aquarium of the Pacific. It's 350,000 gallons, and it's our tropical reef habitat we just call Big Trop. So let's take a look. What, did this, what do we see in our tropical reef habitat. Now you can text in some questions to us. You can also text in some of your observations if you would like. What are some of the things that we notice in this space? This is the, about the right time of the afternoon where the skylights above the exhibit get direct sunlight. So we get a very different look inside a tropical reef during this part of the afternoon. What about the fish? There's a lot of fish in here. We have, I believe, over 800 individuals in this exhibit and almost 100 species of animals. So there's a lot of diversity in our tropical reef habitat. We have a shark right here. There's two species of shark in here. You probably already saw the other one. I got out of the way because the uh, bonnet head sharks do like to hang out in just this zone right where my head would be. So let's see if they come back around. Now, one of my favorite fish in here are, there they are, these. The ones in the back with the little horn. Oh, there's that shark. Told you. Only likes to be right there. Uh, those little fish with a horn on their head are the unicorn surgeon fish or unicorn tangs. Depends on what kind of uh, unicorn fish or surgeon fish you're looking at. But they have that little horn on their head. And for most unicorn fish, that horn doesn't really do much. It's not male versus female. There's members of the same species that do or do not have them. It's just kind of a genetic thing of whether you have it or not. And in other cases, there's unicorn fish that none of them have a horn. Any other special things that you notice about this space? There's a lot of uh, yellow colored things in here. There's a lot of fish with yellow fins. There's a lot of some darker fish in here. There's uh, trevally. Trevally don't often come over to the camera too, so that's nice that they came and paid us a visit. So we have a lot of types of animals in here too. We have the different kinds of fish. We have cleaner wrasses in here. We have one sea turtle who's not visible. He likes to hide way down at the bottom over here. Um, and then we have a lot of the other smaller fish. So even though we can't see the small damselfish, or at least at this point, you can't hardly see the yellow tang that's right there in that staghorn coral. There's a lot of animals in here with a lot of different roles. So the coral reef is a very expansive habitat. Now, if we had a real coral reef this size, about 20, 25 feet tall, that could have taken a long time to grow. So this is all replica coral. We wouldn't want to have this much real coral, not in its normal habitat, but instead to make it a little bit easier, both for the humans to take care of the exhibit, but also a little bit easier on the animals, we can just use replica coral. There are some exhibits with live coral here, we don't have live webcams on them, but we do have some pictures or images of some of the live coral. And Dana's going to, I think, try and find some of that for us. But our live coral has very delicate nature to it. Coral has to have a lot of water flow, a lot of light, and then it has to also have the ability to be fed at a specific time of day. So while coral is an animal, did you all know that coral was an animal? It's not just this rocky structure that kind of looks like this. It's an animal. So there's little animals that live in this and they grow this exoskeletal rocky structure. And during the day, the coral has an algae that's inside its body. It's a nice little roommate that will use photosynthesis to create energy. 
But a lot of the coral at night will feed on the plankton that's moving around. So we have, do we have it? Live coral. Dana's still looking for the live coral. There's so many images of things that we have been showing all of you. We have quite the collection of interesting pictures and videos. So the live coral that we have is in smaller spaces. I think we only have about two exhibits right now with live coral. In them. Now this is not one of ours, but this is coral from the ocean. And what do we notice about the live coral right here? It's brightly colored. This is a type of brain coral. Now brain coral heads can be, I think maybe a few feet across. They're pretty big when they get to a really full size. This is one of the coral species that's not growing extremely fast. The very large branch corals like we saw in the exhibit, like the staghorn coral, they might grow a couple inches a year if the conditions are right. But most other types of coral are growing maybe a centimeter, which is like the width of your pinky. Now, this is a close-up of coral. These, while they might look like anemones, these are the coral bodies. Anemones, coral, and jellies all belong to the same group. So they all have the same ability, which is stinging and grabbing their prey. So corals, and then all the cnidarians have this ability. These coral polyps, they will have their nice little anemone-looking mouths right there. And they can grab food as it moves past them. Now, they also have that algae that's inside their body. And that algae provides the very bright colors that we would be seeing in a real coral reef. Now, we can modify and kind of pretend like we have the same... Uh, coral that is out in the ocean. We can color the coral. We painted the coral. One of the big projects we had here was to repaint all of the coral decorations that go into our tropical reef habitat. So there's, a big, I think, 5,000 different modular pieces that they could put into our tropical reef habitat. And they're on little pegs and they can just stick onto the wall. And when they're dirty, we can pull them off, replace with a clean one, scrub them, clean them up. We can actually soak the coral replica in bleach for a little while to help clean the algae and you know, other gr uh, gross stuff off of there and then we can put it into the clean pile of our uh, pieces and they can go back into the exhibit when it's ready okay so we had a couple questions come in uh gage is asking how can or how do reef sharks migrate well that's a really interesting study because that is something that people are trying to figure out is shark movement shark migration but also what sharks are living where if you haven't heard of the Global Fin Print Project, it's a worldwide video source of scientists going to reefs, dropping cameras into the water, and then they film for about an hour straight. They pull the camera out and they have volunteers tell them where were sharks found. Now, we're not entirely sure how much migration is happening because we have to tag the sharks or identify them on significant physical features so we know which one is which. And then we can try and find them in another place in the world. Now, there's some sharks we do know that migrate a little bit. There's a, like a hammerhead highway, I think somewhere off of South America, where there's a lot of hammerheads that all just show up in one area. They all swim through the same kind of skinny underwater channel. And we've been able to observe that these hammerheads go through the same pattern every year. There's the White Shark Cafe in the Pacific Ocean, where great white sharks will kind of collect all in this one area. And it's not even a small area. It's a very large space. And then once their mating season is over, they will kind of part ways and go back to the areas they came from. So they don't migrate like birds necessarily migrate, where they're just going a north-south route between spring and summer and then fall and winter. They're migrating for some other purposes that we've yet to really learn. So the reason they are doing that gauge is they're following either food sources or they're following uh, to find a mate. They're following a path that they know that they can find a mate from. So what's going on is that they know how to get to these locations and they just swim there. Since they don't have to stop and rest like we do, they can just kind of keep going. Now, another question came in is, can we make replica coral reefs to replace lost coral reefs in the ocean? That's an interesting idea. Now, what I was going to talk about in a little bit, so we'll get to that. What we're going to talk about in a little bit is how scientists are helping grow real live coral instead of using the replica coral. And we'll talk about why that's important too, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, I want to show you some pieces of actual coral. I have a special camera over here, our document camera, that I'm going to show off a few of the pieces of real coral that we have examples of in our studio. So this first one is not the easiest to see. It's kind of a big piece, too. It's, it's a little bit bigger than some of the other pieces we have. But if you look, coral can be really ornate, 
and thin and delicate in some cases. And in other cases, it's very rocky and robust. So here's another kind of branched coral where it's a whole lot thicker. But they're still not very uh, heavy weight with these last two groups, these last two types. And this would be the individual coral body in that space. And now we're going to show you one of the more delicate ones. I'm going to put it right next to another kind of branched, delicate piece. And we're going to zoom way in to take a look at these coral pieces. Zoom. Back it up just a little bit. Hey, there we go. So if we zoom in, we use our special camera to look really close. You can see all the little spaces in the pieces of the coral here. Those holes are where the individual polyps are. Now, coral polyps can be very big differences in size. So the picture we showed you of a coral polyp, I think those are about the size of your finger. Some of these are almost microscopic. And there's even more that we have. Like this is another example of one kind of like this one we have over here. Uh, the polyps would be very, very, very tiny. So it grows this limestone rocky exoskeleton, and it's not one individual, it's a lot of individuals. This is a colonial organism, and the reason they, they are able to do this is the previous generation can kind of grow on top of, or the new generation grows on top of the previous generation. So if imagine if we were able to do this, it's like growing your own apartment building. If we all were able to grow our apartment around us, and the next generation landed on top of your apartment, and they started growing a new apartment on top of you. And they would just gradually grow and grow and grow taller and bigger. Eventually, you'd get to the point of having a reef. Now, remember, I said it can only take uh, maybe a centimeter a year for growth patterns for some of them. So it could take thousands of years to grow 10, 20, 25 feet of a coral reef. When you look out at the ocean, there's also different kinds of coral reefs. There's, well, one, there's different kinds of corals. So these are hard corals. There's also soft corals. But then there's different kinds of reefs because of how they grow and where they've grown around. So around like the Hawaiian Islands, we have what's called a barrier reef, where the island is in the ocean and there's this coral reef that grows up around the island. And then you can have fringing reefs, you can have atolls. So there's different stages of coral reef maturity or age. And so we can see different kinds of coral growing in these areas, different species, different uh, adaptations. And then there's different animals that inhabit it was different regions. But let's talk about some of the generic animals that live near a coral reef. One of the more famous ones that everybody loves to ask us about are the sea turtles. Now, we do have two sea turtles that live here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Those are Theo and Lou. One is in Shark Lagoon, but one is in our tropical habitat. Doesn't come out too often for us to see in the tropical habitat, but sea turtles are a very prominent member of the ocean, and they do migrate for great distances to go lay eggs. Now here's a picture of, I think this might be a green. And the reason you can tell is not just because the picture is labeled, but because these plates right here, these are called scoots. And these plates have a specific pattern and number that are different between different species. So when you look, the other cool thing about sea turtles is the scoots on their head are unique and we can identify an individual based off of the pattern of their scoots. So when you look over at our turtle friend here, this is a unique turtle that we could potentially take a picture of again and figure out who it is. If you are really interested in sea turtle uh, monitoring and sea turtle work, we one of our first weeks that we were doing stuff on our Aquarium Online Academy, Cassandra, one of our staff here, was talking about the green sea turtle conservation and ID project. So check that out. You can find that on our, on our YouTube page. But if you're more curious about sea turtles, definitely uh, look at that resource. This is just one example of an animal that lives in a coral reef. Now this one breathes air. Most of the rest of them are not gonna breathe air. They're gonna be breathing underwater with their gills. So there's a lot of different species of fish. Let's take a look at some brightly colored tropical reef fish and let's see what we can observe about them. So let's see who data can find for us. Do you recognize this fish? Made very popular by a couple of Disney movies. These clownfish come in a large variety of colors. This isn't the only color that clownfish can be, but this is probably the most common thing that we will we'll see now, especially if you are a uh, saltwater aquarium hobbyist, you have your own saltwater aquarium at home. A lot of people have just the orange and white clownfish, and they're living in another animal, an anemone. 
So this is another example of an animal that lives in the coral reef. A lot of animals that live there are very brightly colored or they have the ability to change their colors. One of my favorite fish that lives here, I don't think we have a picture of it, but one of my favorite fish that lives here is the fox face rabbit fish. One, because it has three different animal names in its own name. So that's, that's unique to that one. Uh, but the fox face rabbit fish can also change colors between day and night. There's a lot of fish that do this and it's a very interesting adaptation. So if you are brightly colored during the daytime, you will hide among the coral, the anemones, the other animals that are there. But at nighttime, if you're really brightly colored and there's even a little bit of light, you're still very visible. So the adaptations that they've developed over time, they can change color to be darker at night so they can hide in the darkness of the reef. Now, one of the cool things that we have the opportunity to do here at the Aquarium of the Pacific is look at the difference between daytime fish and nighttime fish and our diurnal or daytime fish will go hide in the reef and change color to their nighttime colors. And so there's a very different look and feel to our tropical reef habitat at night when the exhibit lights are out. So that's another adaptation or thing that these animals are doing. But let's talk about why it's important that these animals are living in a live reef and not just a replica reef. So here at the aquarium, we can re recreate their entire habitat because we're here taking care of the animals. We are providing the food, we are providing the oxygen, we are providing the lighting, we are cleaning the water, we're doing all the jobs that nature would normally do, but we're doing it here for the animals. So, why can't we just put a fake reef out in the ocean? There's a lot of things that the coral reef really does. It's not just a home, it's not just a structure. Remember that algae that's in the coral? It makes oxygen. Most of the oxygen that's uh, in our planet that we enjoy breathing is coming from the ocean. The, all the algae that's living in the ocean, not just the ones on the coral reef, but all the algae living in the ocean produce, I think at least 60% of the oxygen we breathe. So almost two out of three breaths that you take every day, every moment, that's coming from our algae in our ocean. So we need that oxygen content. Now we might be able to do a short-term operation where we have some replica pieces that live coral might grow onto but if we just replace an entire reef with just replica coral, we'll be missing that oxygen resource. Well, guess what? There's also stuff that eats the coral. Now, let's see if we can find a picture of a parrotfish. And I'll talk a little bit about the parrotfish and their interesting adaptations. Now, while we're getting our parrotfish picture, they are a pretty cool fish. Lara was asking, how do sea turtles find and recognize the place they are born so they can lay eggs in the same place. Well, with some animals in the ocean, they can find their way back because of their sense of smell. Remember, turtles breathe air. Do they smell things underwater? Probably not, because they're gonna be snorting the water. That's not healthy if you breathe air. So in a lot of cases, there's the ability to find those locations through one of the magnetic field lines. A lot of them just have very good memories, like whales actually have very good memories of feeding grounds. They're also an air breathing animal. They don't smell the water. They can't say, um, this smells like home. So they can uh, find their previous homes, their feeding grounds, or the beaches that they were coming from in a lot of different ways that do not require the standard senses that we think of. So a good question. And then there's a lot of times the turtles will go back to the same beach they were born on year after year after year to lay their own eggs, but it's not a rule that they all always do this. There's some cases where turtles won't go back to beaches that they have had gone to lay eggs before. And in some cases, uh, with the uh, tra uh, trash and plastic cleanup that's going on in the world, they're cleaning up beaches that were not inhabited by turtles for decades. And turtles came back to those beaches after they were cleaned up enough that the turtles could get to them. So in some cases, this is a few generations, potentially, between when turtles stopped going to these beaches and now that they've restarted. So if they can recognize that it's a beach that they can get up onto in a region that they can have uh, their babies, they can lay their eggs. They will re uh, go up to those beaches after a year or two, or maybe they'll go back to different beaches at times to lay their eggs. Now this is our parrotfish friend. This parrotfish has very specialized teeth to grab and bite the coral. So there's living things not only in the coral, the coral itself, but there's stuff growing on top of the coral. Now parrotfish chew that coral and that's where their food is at, is it's living on, in, around that coral itself. And it doesn't really digest the, the hard coral shell, the skeleton. So if it took a, a bite out of this, this chunk of coral, it's not breaking down the limestone in its body. 
what its body is doing is grinding it up into smaller bits and it eventually becomes sand. So a lot of the sand that shows up on the white sandy beaches that are natural beaches is from, coral, is from a parrotfish poop that was coral at one point. So we, we couldn't put plastic or concrete coral out there because then a fish like this doesn't have a food source. Now it might eat other things too, but it's lacking that food source. And over time, we won't have the white sandy beaches in these tropical locations that we do now. Beaches like we have here in Southern California, a lot of that sand is trucked in. It's mined somewhere else and it's turned into sand, it's ground down into the fine points it is, and then it's taken to the beach. But there's also pieces of shells and other things that are naturally developing on our beaches that are natural sand. But a lot of sand that we go to that we enjoy having uh, a beach weekend at would be from sand that was brought to the Southern California beaches. So sand is important for tropical habitat because those turtles have to get up on the sand. Other animals have to use the sand like sand crabs. So if this animal is not cre creating or producing that sand because they're eating coral, it changes the habitat a little bit too. Now they're not the only thing that produces sand. A lot of wave action and erosion is producing sand. So they're not the only thing that's helping produce that sand, but they are a big help. And so if they don't have that food source, they can't help make the sandy beaches that we think of. All right, now I said we were talking about some of the things that we are doing to help save coral reefs and provide uh, new spaces for them. One of the cool things we're doing and partnering with is a group called CCOR. So it's Sexual Coral Reproduction. And what we're doing is we're sending our staff over to the tropical islands to help the scientists that are there collect reproductive cells and help outplant or put coral out into the ocean that is real coral. Now this is something, this is a little device that scientists took a while to figure out exactly how to make it right. This is called a tetrapod. So tetra in our science terms means four. So it has four points. It sets up kind of like a very skinny pyramid. But other tetrapods, <clears throat> I think Daniel will show us another picture of tetrapods. Other tetrapods are very thick. And what scientists had to figure out is that you couldn't just throw a bunch of these into the ocean or into a laboratory setting even and let coral grow on them. It doesn't just land and start growing. So these are other tetrapods that people have used. Now, if you notice on these tetrapods, there's stuff growing on them. These are different stages of succession or something lives in one spot first and something else grows next and then something else grows next. And what scientists found is that the correct stages of succession will help everything grow faster because the coral polyp or the coral juveniles would not really grow up on a very blank and clean tetrapod, they needed dirty tetrapods. Not dirty like gross and like disgusting dirty, but dirty with algae. So they needed red algae, red crustose algae to start growing on the tetrapods first in a lot of these cases. And that was the food source for the coral to originally land there, munch some of that out, and it starts growing into its adult body shape. And if it had just perfectly clean tetrapods, it wouldn't work. And in some cases, scientists are figuring these things out by accident, which is actually a very common thing in science is we find something out looking for something else. And by having these overgrown uh, algae crusted tetrapods and then finding, oh, there's a lot of coral that started growing on these, but not the other ones without this algae, they figured out that we could speed up the process by growing coral on these algae crusted tetrapods. And then we can take them out and put them in the ocean in very specific locations with our GPS coordinates, so we know where we put them. And then we can just let this tetrapod with coral growing on it help grow more coral around it. Now, one of the other interesting scientific discoveries was the way that we propagate coral. So I think we have a, a quick little video of our coral propagation room. Oh, here's a dirty, dirty tetrapod. It's got stuff growing on it. This actually has some uh, coral pieces growing on it and they just put it out into the ocean in some cases they're just seeding it so they lay them out so that things can grow on them but that's kind of a taking a chance in some cases so they figured out well if we do this in the lab first if we grow it on the tetrapods and then we plant the tetrapods into the ocean we're ensuring a higher rate of success of us putting coral out into the ocean that will survive so we do some of our experiments to see what helps coral grow the fastest here at our exhibit spaces so behind the scenes we have our coral propagation area. Our coral propagation uh, is mimicked by uh, like copying other people's discoveries. This is our coral propagation room. It doesn't look fantastic from this angle, but I promise you, this is one of my favorite spots in the building because this room is 
amazing. So in each of these tubs are different kinds of coral. And in some cases, it's coral that we broke into smaller bits, we glue it onto a little stand, and we just keep growing it up. And in other cases, this is where we put coral, coral that's in quarantine. So sometimes coral is found where somebody was trying to move it someplace where they weren't supposed to, or in one case, uh, maybe they weren't allowed to finish their import process that was completely legal. And the customs agents don't want to just get rid of the coral, so we have been uh, uh, receiving some coral every once in a while. Not very commonly, but every once in a while. And we'll grow it in our quarantine lab, and then we can give it out to other zoos and aquariums that we're partnered with in the AZA, Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And in other cases, we're growing it to help create more coral in our own exhibits. So here's the actual video of the coral propagation area. So here's all the new coral pieces that are glued to their own little base now. These are some of the bigger ones. And what we found in the scientific community is that the smaller chunks you break coral down into, the faster they regrow into their full size. And that's an interesting thing to think about. Why would that happen? Why would if we broke it apart, would coral grow back faster? What happens naturally in a coral reef, a tropical habitat, not just wave action crashing and breaking up on the coral, storm activity, hurricanes, typhoons, these happen pretty regularly. And if they break down the coral to a certain level, Naturally, the coral should be able to regrow. It might take a while, but they can regrow over time. So that's an interesting adaptation where if the coral is broken, it can start releasing the hormones to start growing back faster. So this is what looks like in one of our coral propagation tubs. And what we started doing, our staff, is experimenting with the tetrapods here. We shared our knowledge with people in Seacore. We had our staff go there to help collect reproductive cells with the staff from Seacore where they were collecting the the sperm and egg cells in the water from the, the coral during reproductive season, and they're broadcast spawners. So they just release sperm and egg into the water. They would collect it, separate it in some cases. They know which one's which, which one's sperm, which one's eggs. But then they also try to find the embryos, the fused sperm and egg together, so that we can try and put those into a space where we can grow more coral. Now, this is not a quick process. It's not an easy process. And in some cases, it's uh, working overnight to help collect these coral reproductive cells. So it's not the cleanest job to be par a participant in this. These are uh, the egg cells from this coral that's in this bucket right here. So during spawning season, you can collect those reproductive cells and start trying to create embryos, have them land on tetrapods or other surfaces that you figured out that coral can grow on, and then waiting for them to grow to a point where if you put that object into the ocean, it will survive. So we're very proud of the efforts that our staff and our husbandry department has done. They've traveled halfway across the world to help participate in this effort on the island of Fiji, including our, our uh, head of our husbandry group, uh, Sandy Troutline. She has helped with some of this too. Uh, Janet Monday and then uh, Danny Munoz has also helped too. We have pictures of them. They've done lectures here. So that's another thing you can do. If you are more interested in coral health, what people are doing to help with coral, the Aquarium of the Pacific has a lot of resources at your disposal. You can go to our lecture archives on our YouTube page, just like you might be watching this video right now, and you can find our C-Core lecture series where we had different staff talking about coral health. Or we have other experts in the field come and talk at our aquarium too. So if you would like to learn a whole lot more about all the animals that live in a coral reef, and in some cases we have lectures about photography of the animals in these spaces. So there's a lot to learn about all these fun things that we have available for you all to use too. All right. I think, we're all, I think we've answered all of our questions that were coming in. I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for Aquarium Online Academy about the coral reef and coral uh, conservation and health. And do check out some of our resources that are already on our website and our YouTube page so that you can learn a whole lot more about the coral reef habitat and what people are doing to help make sure that they're staying healthy out in the ocean. Have a good rest of your Monday afternoon and stay tuned. Come back at 2 o'clock. We're going to be doing a squid dissection. Have a good afternoon, everyone.